All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special developer interview um, as part of the Orbex Fly July series. Now, if you haven't already seen what Fly July is, well, it's a it's a fantastic opportunity for simmers across the community, um, developers, publishers, content creators, and so on, are all celebrating the month of July by helping to educate newcomers and experienced simmers alike into a little bit more about what happens in the world of flight simulation. So over the next month, you're gonna see community fly-ins, you're gonna see developer interviews such as this, and also roundtables and a whole host of other amazing things coming from an array of developers, publishers, content creators, and news outlets as well. So today I am joined by Dean from DC Designs, and we're gonna talk a little bit about aircraft development for a particular, uh, for a very particular type of aircraft talk a little bit about DCS as well. And we're also just gonna talk a little bit about how fighter jets are currently uh, being brought into the world of Microsoft Flight Simulator. So with all that said and done, I'm very, very, very excited to be talking to Dean. So Dean, hello and welcome to Fly July. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem. So I, I guess, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about yourself, what you do um, and kind of the journey you took to get to where you are today. Uh, right, DC Designs, yeah, this is a company developing aircraft for Microsoft Flight Simulator, and we aim for the middle. We're not study level designers, um, but we're not freeware either. We're just in that, what well, we like to try and make the sweet spot of aircraft that are easy for people to access, but have enough going on to keep them occupied. Uh, and so, so fun is, is, is the main thing for DC Designs and the aircraft we build. Um, I got into this in 2017. Um, I'd spent the uh, preceding 10 years as an author, as a Sunday Times best-selling author. Um, but I also like flight sim and I liked aviation. I'd done my pilot's license. Um, and it was the arrival of via, virtual reality that really changed things for me and made me no longer just want to use flight sim, but I wanted to actually start developing uh, for it and, and seeing if I could build the aircraft that uh, others had not built for the sim. And uh, it took me about uh, three years to go from deciding I wanted to do something to releasing my first commercial product on uh, FSX and Prepare 3D in 2020. And that was the first uh, product, was the F-18 Super Hornets. So it's quite the, journey, um, quite the journey then, three years. Quite a long journey, yeah. I'd, I'd released uh, some freeware beforehand as I got better, uh, the P61 Black Widow, um, which was the aircraft I started with. That was the one I, nobody had really built before, I don't think. Mm. Uh, and so I did that freeware. It wasn't good enough to be power yet, but as time developed and I learned to use a, a program called Blender, which is very up to date, uh, I started to realise that oh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm getting towards somewhere where I could actually do something that was commercially viable uh, and so in uh, I think it was August 2019 I wrote my last novel at the end sent it off and um, spent the next six months developing the Hornets and they were released in February 2020 I think uh, and I've just gone on from there and it's been my full-time job ever since. Wow okay so a few questions come right off the bat here so I'm I'm really thinking about those who might be watching thinking I'd love to create aircraft kind of where where in this journey did you kind of have to start before you could really spend that much time developing it? Was it the research into the type of aircraft you wanted to uh, bring to the market? Was it the market itself? Like what kind of things started that process for you? I, um, I had a slight advantage. I'd spent 10 years with an online VA called ModSim flying military stuff, uh, simulating the RAF and, and fleet air arm and so on. So I had a limited understanding of how the sim worked. Um, but for me, the, the, the starting point was just a lot of reading, mm. um, especially on sites like fsdeveloper.com, AvSim, Sim Outhouse, sort of the, the, all the places where, if it's elite, all the places where um, you could find information, you could look at what other people were doing, you could try to understand how I might go about building an entire aircraft because it's, the 3D modelling is the obvious one you've got to learn, uh, but there's, and as soon as you start getting into it, you realise there's just so much more. Uh, the vast majority of developers are like me, one-man bands, you know, might hire some people for some certain things on contract, but 
most of it is just us. So tremendous amount of learning. So a lot of reading to get going, mm. and a lot of a lot of trying to decide which program was the best one to use for the development side, the three D work. You know, is it three DS Max? Is it FSDS as it was back in the day, or Blender? I started with FSDS, which is now no longer usable for flight sim. It's quite an old program, and realised fairly quickly it just you know it wasn't up to the job of what you need these days moved on to blender hard to learn but i started to get going mm. and, and over that sort of first year i was also reading about how textures are done what pbr is because that was starting to come in about then uh and just trying to keep up to date with everything because it's a constantly evolving uh, hobby really i mean every year it changes even on the prior platforms now because we've got microsoft flight simulator that process is all starting again as we learn to use uh, some new and very up-to-date tools. So, yeah, anybody who's thinking about getting into this, it, it, the learning never ends. It doesn't matter how far you get down the road, it, it just always seems to be more to learn. But it does it does get easier as you go along. So before all of this, you had no experience in 3D modelling, texturing at all? No. I was uh, Before I was an author, I was a graphic designer for a sign-making company, but it was very basic, 2D, mostly text. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I had to go in the deep end. Um, and it, it, it's, it's really difficult to learn, you know, sound, aerodynamics, physics, you know, there's so many things. Um, and each one's creeping along gradually because you can't really devote too much time to one thing. You have to keep building an airplane, you have to keep adding the sound and, and so on. Um, and so you just, yeah, you're gradually building this corpus of knowledge and, and mm. eventually it starts to fall into place. But that's why it took me three years to go from zero to to, to re releasing a commercial product because it, there's just so much to learn and I really didn't have any background in it. Wow, so it, it just goes to show, doesn't it? You, If you really want to do something like this, it will take time, but it, it eventually can be done. And, and it's oh, not yeah. like you're making aircraft that, and I mean this quite respectfully, but the aircraft you make are not necessarily like the simplistic type of aircraft because military aircraft are... A very different kettle of fish to say like a Cessna or you know some of the other smaller GA aircraft because so you had a lot of challenges I I remember you talking about bringing like supersonic stuff into into the new sim I mean that was that in itself was a learning curve for you because that wasn't I believe part of the SDK or part of that documentation at the time is that right? Yeah that's right Mike um, Asobo had decided to block supersonic flight we didn't know how um, it turned out to be really simple uh, they just created in the uh, flight model config file um, just a massive amount of drag the moment you reach supersonic speeds. So it's mm. like hitting a wall. You just stopped and you couldn't go any faster. Mm. Um, uh, and, and so it took a while. It was actually, I think it was Dave Iris come up to me and said, have you figured this out yet? And I hadn't really got around to it. And I started to dig into the files and I just suddenly <laughs> saw it, you know, took it out and the F-15s were suddenly supersonic without any trouble at all. <laughs> I'm not even sure why Sobo did it. I can see nothing in the team that would stop you from being, you know, the, the, the performance is still fine. I think most supersonic flight occurs at quite high altitudes anyway. Mm. Not sure. I think they I think they already knew that somewhere down the line they were going to be doing something with it and uh, and perhaps just wanted to hold people back. They, they should have known us better by then. <laughs> if it's not, certainly not always me, but certainly always somebody finds a way and, and, and gets these things to work. Yeah, I mean, def I mean, in all the years I've been involved in flight simulation, you see the development progress, and developers are always finding creative and in, in innovative ways to to kind of break that next barrier and stuff. So I guess this is just one of them. And like you said, eventually it was going to be going to be found out. Um, I think you raise a really good point, though. Um, you speaking to another developer to help support your work, and I I think there's this perception within the community that developers are always working against one another there's never that collaborative approach is there something more you can kind of add on to to how you've worked with other developers to resolve issues to better the community and better your own products we're asking each other stuff all the time especially you know, not so much on the older platforms because they were so well established everyone kind of knew and there was a lot of knowledge online about how to do x y and z might take you a while to find it but you could always discover independently information now of course especially the last six months i mean 
I've, I, I think I've spoken to pretty much every developer out there about one thing or another. And, and the same back, we're helping each other all the time. We share code. We, we, we you know, if somebody works out how to do something, we will we'll generally share it uh, mm -hmm. to help others. Um, new ways of using PBR, especially variables in Microsoft Flight Simulator, which is the code that governs how a switch works, how um, certain failures will work. Although they use the most of the same variables from FSX, because that's the, obviously the donor program that started it all, they've added a lot more, they work differently, and we're, we're discovering stuff all the time. I spent ages, ages trying to make glass transparent and shiny at the same time. Weeks. <laughs> and then somebody else said, oh, you just do that. <laughs> and that's happened quite a few times where somebody spent times somebody goes, oh, you just do that. So ultimately, we're helping each other all the time. Always talking to amongst ourselves on, on Discord and um, the, the channel I'm on, fortunately, we've got about uh, nine or ten members of the Asobo team on it as well. Mm. So we're asking them everything all the time. We would have never joined because so many questions. Um, but I've noticed, funny enough, as time's gone by now, it's getting quieter. Mm. Everyone's kind of built up enough knowledge now that. If we can't figure something out, we, we, we kind of have to it ourselves first, you know what I mean? It, we, we've got, we found roots through now and, and we're not hassling us over quite as much as we used to. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And it's great to hear that there is such a collaborative approach going on behind the scenes. Um, and ultimately that's going to only benefit the community as a whole because it helps you to improve your products and bring them to market a bit faster as well. So whilst we're still on the subject of development, you've sent me some screenshots uh, prior to to this chat today about kind of the processes and some of the kind of a bit like behind the scenes of you developing uh, your aircraft. So I wondered if you would be able to kind of take us through some of that development phase to maybe help others kind of get an idea of exactly the effort and the work you have to put in to create um, the fighter jets that you've so far built for uh, Microsoft Flight Sim. Sure, yeah. Um, which one would you like to to start with um are they in any particular is there like a chronological order we can go in or is there i think um let's just go in um a, sim a simple order uh we'll take the first image f16c cockpit mm. uh this is an image there's actually uh the f16 viper it's on under development by sc designs which is my sister company um which just shows a product that's just underway. This is all being built from scratch. This is in Blender uh, and shows um, what I thought might be an interesting image for those who, who might be considering getting into this kind of thing. Um, how you start and where you go from. And, and the reason I chose this particular image is because there's kind of different stages of the process in view all at the same time. You've got the ejection seat there that's clearly textured and modelled, but it's not quite ready yet you know there's more to be done there mm -hmm. the main cockpit itself uh, is just a plain material nothing's been textured it's all being built out of simple shapes and then we weld them together to make the overall shape uh, rather than trying to go intricately from one thing to a switch to another thing we build them all as separates and then join them together at the end um, and you can see also some of the use of a product that's called substance painter which is just the most fantastic piece of kit that's come along in recent years for flights and development. And the um, the console cover that you can see in the shot, all that lovely kind of black textured metallic stuff and that, that's actually something we can do quite easily now with Substance Painter. You select a material or one that you've created yourself and just put it on there and it will find all the edges and find all the shapes and wow. apply that material to it in one easy move rather than prior, which would have taken me, you know, an entire morning, perhaps even an entire day just to texture that one particular object. We can now use materials like that. And uh, as I've developed along in that, I've created my own so that I've got one nice one that's for a TV screen that you see in a lot of cockpits and stuff when it's off. It has that kind of sheen to it, and I, I can now use it on every TV screen I ever build. So you build up a, a library of materials that can be reused across different aircraft. Mm. Um, and that, that sort of shows an aircraft in production that is, is just in currently just in the 3D uh, development tool. It's it's flying in the scene, but there has no cockpit at the moment, and that's what's underway. There's some designs. Um, so, so how long has it taken you to kind of get to this stage so far with this 
with what we're seeing on screen at the moment. The cockpit there, that's probably, I would imagine, about two weeks' work to get to there, something like that. Um, and in fact, it's tied, that image ties in very well with, with something that, that is very different now about Microsoft Flight Simulator. And actually, uh, we've got the, uh, another image, uh, also of a cockpit. This is the F-14 Tomcat, which is my next release. It's due out end of June, perhaps very early August. Um, and this is a big and very good difference between Microsoft Flight Simulator and the older platforms. And that is that you build the exterior model without a cockpit. And then the okay. cockpit you build is an entirely separate model. And then you tell the simulator through its config files to show the exterior while you're sitting in the cockpit and vice versa. And by bringing those two together, it means you don't have to board the whole aircraft twice. In the older sims, if you built the virtual cockpit, you also have to put the wings on, the tail, anything you could see as you're looking around in the sea. Uh, yeah. Now we don't have to do that. Now we can, now we can just do the one uh, set of models and then combine them at the end, and that gives a lot more flexibility. Um, not to mention the fact that with the new platform, much more scope for realism. Mm. Uh, the poly counts can be much higher. I was always very conservative with poly counts. I, got, I actually got a lot of flack for that from the F-15s. They were saying, well, they're not detailed enough. Uh, but they were built for um, the older platforms. And I, I was aware that most people had older PCs. And so rather than build this all singing, all dancing aircraft, I wanted something that could perform well, even when there's a lot of weather on and a lot of AI flying around. It wouldn't slow their computers down. The new flight simulator, of course, has removed that problem. So with the Tomcats, I've been able to go to a much, much higher level of detail without compromising that performance. Um, so so probably anybody who's got the F-15s looking at that picture, they will be able to see straight away that there's a lot more detail going on. And that's that's the way we're going to go forwards uh, with the company, keep that at a high level of detail and roll it back also onto the previous releases like the Steam and, and the F-15s and keep bringing them up until we finally reach that level where Microsoft Flight Simulator is sort of more, sta more stable, more established. Mm. Um, and then everything will be up to date and, and move forward with new products. Yeah, I can see immediately just looking at this picture, you can see kind of the the switches and the buttons onto the panel on the left hand side of the, the pilot. You've got the pilots and there's a lot of intricate, finer details, even from quite a zoomed out distance you can already see here. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah trying to get everything up to the level of because I I think personally I'm I'm slightly behind the other guys, the other developers, they always built for very high fidelity on the older platforms and to help with performance. You know, just trying, trying to make things always as detailed as possible. And so I, I picked a slightly like, lesser level of detail but better performance. And now, of course, that means I've got to do some catching up hmm. in Microsoft Flight Simulator, really to bring up my products up to the same level as everybody else's. Um, but that's something I'm keen to do and get done and, and continue forward in that vein. Um, it's funny you should mention the pilots. Normally, we wouldn't put them in there. Um, but as the next image is active crew this is a, a shot in the f-14 actually in flight looking back over your shoulder and you can see the rio the rear seater in the cockpit oh, this yeah. is something this is something that normally only happen in dcs world um when you occupy the seat you can see your co-pilot and vice versa if you step into the back seat in the f-14 you can see forwards uh, and it's something we've learned how to do in microsoft flight simulator now so that uh, we actually model the pilots in the cockpit. The F-14 will have its own patches. You can put your own patches on the pilot, your own face on the pilot. Your helmet's all um, doable as well. Visor comes up and down, the mask comes off. Wow. Um, so that you can really feel like you're in the, in the airplane with another person. Um, and, and that's also being rolled back to the Stearman and the F-15s as well for the same reasons. It's nice. I really enjoy it in VR. To feel like you're actually flying with somebody else. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, not have to remove them with a switch or something to get in their seat. That just happens automatically. They'll just disappear when you occupy their seat. Um, and that's a nice feature that is, is, is possible with the new sim that we couldn't really do with the old ones. Right, yeah. Uh, um, and, and keeps up the DCS world, which is always good when it comes to military. They sort of got the best toys when it comes to that. So we're on the, the catch-up there and trying to, <laughs> trying to make these aeroplanes as good as we, we're never going to be quite the same. But, yeah. you know, it's good to give the same entertainment value, perhaps, as, as you get in DCS World with these kind of aircraft. Definitely. I, I think it's also cool as well that like you're being able to pick up these new skills and techniques, but also bring them back to 
currently release their craft as well, just to again continue that level of customer support as well, which is cool. Yeah, it's really important to roll back stuff that I've learned. I mean, the F-15s came out end of January, we're now July, August mm. nearly. And, um, you know, every time I learn something new, I immediately want to roll it back. But the updates take a while, it's, especially when it's F-15, there's four aircraft in the package. So every update has to be done four times effectively. Yeah. So it takes a bit longer. But um, yeah, wherever I get to, I always want my previous products to catch up with that. And hopefully in the next year or two, once the new sim settles down, that, that will no longer be required, you know, we'll, we'll be up to date with everything. Yeah. And the pro products will be stable thereafter, which which would be good, because there's so much more to learn at the moment. Yeah. Um, one of the big things that people talk about, I've got uh, an image here, uh, the uh, HTML HUD and HUD VDI images as a pair there. These are, these are something new uh, that a lot of people have been asking for. These are actually HTML coded. Uh, okay. These are actual native um, Microsoft Flight Simulator gauges, not the old style XML that we've all been using up to now. Nobody's uh, got an HTML that's custom into the sim yet. Uh, as far as I know, Aerosoft might have done with their CIJ, I suspect, but uh, uh, nobody's done it with a proper heads up display. And this is, um, this is where we're at at the moment. This is, we're kind of halfway there. It looks much more like an F14 HUD now. The VDI looks good. Um, but uh, that's also kind of a, a new skill that we're, we're having to learn. And it's, I'm not doing most of the work. <laughs> I've hired somebody far cleverer than me who, uh, it's just too much to do it all. The new sim is so much more complex right? Um, that I, I recognise pretty soon that yeah, I can't, I just can't do everything anymore. Um, and so I, I the code name Jack, his name, his name is, and um, he's, he's, he's a whiz at this. He's, he's been working on this for a while now. They're, they're much sharper, much higher performance. Uh, we gain 10 frames just by putting these in the 15s. Wow. Um, because MSFS just isn't really designed for XML when it comes to gauges. Mm. Um, and that plays well, of course, into the forthcoming Xbox release, which really needs planes to be optimised very well to, to get the performance on the console. Uh, so we're just in time with that, basically. Uh, they, they, these will be coming as stock with the F-14 and, again, be rolled back with a different layout for the F-15s. Amazing. Very good. And then also that performance increase with the new SIM update that we saw just a couple of days ago, or whenever oh, yeah. this is published, but... That that having a like fifty sixty percent increase plus your increase for this, you know, it's I think when that sim first released and the performance was kind of um, criticised, you know, eventually it was always going to work out because people were going to become more accustomed to developing it or finding new techniques and tools and even the sim builders themselves are going to find different ways to to rewrite the code. So um, that's really really promising to hear and hopefully other developers again pick up on these types of things as well for the future for their for their products. Yeah, I certainly hope so. The one thing I'd love to see, and I'm hoping a Saibo do it for me, but I haven't got to, is because uh, I've got an F-18 Super Hornet coming as free DLC uh, later in the year, and I'm hoping they found a way to collimate the hub properly. I think okay. if we can get the collimated hubs. We used to do it in P3D and FSX. It was a, a trick of the light. It was smoke and mirrors, uh, but it worked. Uh, we can't do that in the new sim because of the ability to have glass frosting the HUD used to be projected out and mod in front of the aeroplane. Right. So it stayed where it was when it moved around. Uh, we can't do that now. So we're hoping that they've got some clever bit of code that we can just use, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and make things magically work the way we need them to, because that's the last step. We're good column 80 HUD, and I think um, with the HTML code that we're getting into now, I think we'll have everything we need then to make really good fires uh, for uh, all kinds of military aircraft for flights in now. Awesome. So I've, I'm just looking at your screenshots. This one that's quite interesting to me in particular, especially as you're an aircraft developer, and that is the whole flight testing element of things. So I can kind of understand how you build models and you texture it. That somewhat makes sense in my head at least. But when it comes to actually how do you test if this plane is flying as intended? Like how do you kind of gain that knowledge, gain that experience, and then how do you then replicate that in the sim? We have, we have quite a long process really that goes on throughout the entire development of the aircraft. Um, the first step is getting hold of manuals, for, if possible, for the actual aircraft itself. Um, that's what's done with the F-15s. Um, I'm glad you've spoken about this actually because it's something I want to bring up. Um, 
we, we match the aircraft very closely. The F-15 actually has the most realistic fighter jet model in Microsoft Flight Simulator at this time. None of the others are even close to it. Um, but we often get messages. Um, I'm flat out in full afterburner at 50,000 feet and I've only got 500 knots on the clock. This is garbage. <laughs> well, anybody who knows about aviation knows that 500 knots at 50,000 feet is about Mark 2.1. guess that's blooming fast. <laughs> They don't know, they don't know, it's not their fault, they just don't understand that these things are aerodynamically very realistic because the flight sim is. And that was just as true back in FSX and P3D in a black and white numbers way. Um, so a lot of the time you, you, can get, you can get targeted for people saying, oh, it's not realistic because so-and-so's jet does Mark II at sea level. No <laughs> aircraft in the world can do that. It just can't be done fastest aircraft in history at low level was the Tornado F3 of all things, Mark 1.3 at sea level I think it was. Um, our aircraft, although I don't build study level, they're designed to have very, very realistic flight dynamics because it's all about the flight. Mm. Um, and so we get the original manuals if we can, we get the flight, all those charts you get, flight modelling charts that tell you what mark can be achieved at what altitude, at what weight and so on. And then we build it like that, we take it into the sim, you have tools inside the sim, which give live readouts as you're flying about, and that's probably in the image at the time there. I think it was a bit of code on the F-14 there on that particular shot, but mm. on the right-hand side there's a window, and it has about 20 different options. And we can actually see the flight model working as we're moving the aircraft. You can see airflow, you can see the amount of um, impact on the flight surfaces, how much they're moving, all these things. And then we time that, or rather my testers, <laughs> against the data we have for the real aircraft. And we just keep playing with it until they match. And uh, there's one of the um, best tests my, my guys ever did. The original F-15A was able to shoot down satellites. They had a special profile where they would take off, go vertical, over onto their back, roll out 30,000 feet, accelerate to Mark II, pull up again, go to 70,000 feet, and launch the missile against a satellite. And my guys got that down to, I think it was three seconds. Wow. Of the actual act of doing that in a real F-15A in the DC Designs F-15C. And it's the same for turn rates, turn radius, stall angles. Uh, the guys take things far further than I have had before. The flight models are far better than they were in the older platforms. Um, but So that's how we do it. The, the in-sim tools give you everything you need as before you had to do it outside of the sim. Now it's all in-sim, which is a lot, lot better. Um, but it then introduces the problem of, well, now you're getting quite realistic. And <laughs> uh, some of the questions I get are, oh, the F-15 should be able to pull 9Gs all the time. No, it yeah. shouldn't, you know, you can't do that at 200 knots, you can pull about 3G. There's so many real things that now are starting to creep in that, um, that to some extent we're having to change the DC Designs mission statement a little bit and start introducing failures when people get things wrong or warning lights and things because... Uh, yeah, things are starting to get quite realistic now, and um, yeah, these things that are often seen as flaws are in fact realistic. And, uh, yeah. uh, and, and the further we go, and I'm pretty sure this will continue into the future, the further the better the technology gets, the better our PCs get at handling this kind of stuff. I mean, the weathering, the sim is just phenomenal, mm. and it does affect your aircraft, you know, the different temperatures, and I've noticed it. Um, that's only going to become more realistic, and therefore people are going to to some extent, have to know a bit more about aviation and able to get the pest out of any aircraft, regardless of whether it's a fighter or a Cessna. So what, what, just thinking on that line of things then, what are you doing then as a developer? What do you think could be done as a developer of aircraft to kind of educate these people who may have these questions or these concerns? Because um, I've seen it plenty of times, read the manual, and let's be honest, that, that solution is never the... Uh, that um, that's never really the solution, is it? Because people don't want to read the manual. So, just kind of, right. what what are you doing to to help with that? And what tools do you think Microsoft have built in that could help you with those type of things? The sim does have. Um, you can dial down the detail levels in terms of the flight model and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, because especially fighter aircraft are so unique in many of their aspects. Things are done with code rather than with the base flight model, and so that, that, that doesn't have an effect. If mm. the Tomcats, for instance, the original F 14A had very vulnerable engines, they weren't really designed for an air combat platform. And if you put too much rudder in at certain 
flop, parts of the flop envelope, it'll store the engine, the inside engine. You get that flat spin, famous and top gun, and how it goes in there. Um, and we put that in there. That's not something you can switch off, unfortunately. We could tie it to a switch, a realism switch, but then you know it's just going to turn you off. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going down the route of warning lights, and if you don't pay attention to the warning light, then we're going to drop it on you. And, and you, you <laughs> because well, I can't see any way around it, frankly. If we, I still don't want to go study level in terms of systems. Yeah. I like people to be able to fly the aircraft. But as I said before, you know the air, the air dynamics are part of that enjoyment to me anyway, and I think for most people. And so yeah, people want to know when they're pushing it too far. You know, they want to know. Yeah. Um, a real aircraft would have things like buffet stall and that to tell you what's going on. A bit difficult to have that kind of tactile thing in a sim. So we have the failures, and I think we're gonna you're gonna see more of those in DC Designs aircraft, uh, Concorde in particular, uh, <laughs> which is also getting some some serious upgrades. Um, to bring these kind of things in, to try and bring that realism level up. Um, and also I'm thinking about um, some kind of FAQ for each aircraft, something that's more accessible than the manual, possibly in the cockpit, a button you can press on a screen will just say the, the key things perhaps, or things to look out for. Um, I, I wish people would read the manuals. We spent <laughs> weeks writing these things. It's all there. You yeah. know, and then you, it is all there. And if you read it once, you pretty much got everything you need to know. But but it seems so few take the time to do that. Um, and, and <laughs> some of the other developers have just come to reply to RTFM now. We the <laughs> fabulous manual um, <laughs> because uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's all there. It just takes a little bit of time and effort. Xbox Crowd, I can't see that happening. But we can't we can't release different aircraft. You know, it's all kind of one thing now. So. Yeah. Um, but then I guess they'll just think they're in the top gun, you know, and spin, around. To spin yeah. around. You can't restart the engine. Actually, I don't, I don't, I've overdone it. I, I took off in a crosswind in F 14, lost an engine, so I'm motoring into the crosswind all the time. <laughs> um, so I had to go for the fun of a restart before, you know, just really low off the ground. But it worked because yeah. I built the thing, I knew what to do, you know, and, and saved the airplane. I thought that was really cool because that could happen in real life. I'm sure it will be nice at some point or other. Um, and it felt like I had an emergency on my hands. Um, so I'm, I'm getting to, I don't want to get too far away from the DC Designs core mission statement, which is fun over everything else, but I enjoyed that little experience and I thought, yeah, this is the right way to go with it. This is a bit more, a little bit more than, than we've done before. Amazing. I, I think your idea of like a kind of a FAQ type of thing is, is a really good idea because it's kind of instant information and I think that will really help, um, especially yeah. with... As you say, those come those coming out for like the console edition that'll be coming out at the end of July. Um, so, just kind of diverting a little bit away from Microsoft Flight Sim because we've obviously spoken about that quite significantly. Um, there's obviously going to be comparisons between DCS, which you you mentioned earlier, and had all the is like the all singing all dancing combat sim and does a fantastic job at doing that. So, kind of from your perspective, then why? Why would people have a fighter jet in Microsoft Flight Sim, which doesn't necessarily replicate kind of the aerial dogfights and the the weapons and stuff? And you know, why would they choose to fly that sort of aircraft in this sim versus DCS, in your opinion? Well, the answer's in your question, really. Um, Ninety-nine point nine percent of all dogfights don't result in real life in a weapons release. Fighter pilots spend their entire lives training. They don't shoot each other down, though. Um, weapons firing in real life is actually quite a rare thing, be it in combat or in training, because they're mm. quite expensive to, and you need something to shoot down as well, so they have to fly a drone off to, to go and give them something to shoot at. Uh, dog fighting is as much fun without weapons as it is with weapons. Uh, the sim's quite capable of it. It's, it's whether you have the skills to keep your energy up and exploit the advantages of your aircraft against another in order to defeat them and get behind them. Um, DCS World is yeah, undisputed king of simulating everything to do with combat, but that's its role. It's, that's why it's called a combat simulator, as you said. Yeah. Flight simulator is more about the flight. It doesn't have the weapons. It doesn't yet have the systems. I, I wouldn't mind betting it pretty soon will have. I don't think it'll be far behind. Um, but for me, the, the fun of, of, of fighter aircraft, apart from enjoying them and liking them anyways, is the fact you can go to head-to-head in a dogfight in, in Microsoft Flight Simulator and you can do it anywhere in the world. Mm. 
You can do it in your own house. You can't do that in DCS mode. And you can do it in conditions that are like real life. Uh, when the carrier module comes in, um, is it November, I think, the, the F-18 and the carrier coming to, D, uh, to MSFS? Yeah. <clears throat> That's just another thing that MSFS can do anywhere in the world. Uh, and it does give it that key advantage. If, if, and I, I'm pretty sure, I know Microsoft themselves don't want weapons portrayed on the marketplace, but there's going to be a, eventually a weapons add-on for Microsoft Flight Simulator, and then it'll be able to do pretty much everything that DCS can do, mm. and just do it everywhere. I don't see any reason why anybody wouldn't fly a military aircraft in in um, in Microsoft Flight Simulator. People tend to have their favourites. A lot of people who use Flight Sim tend to be, in fact, the bulk of people tend to be tube liners and general aviation. It's about eighty percent of the market, but about twenty percent is military hmm. by sales. About twenty percent of all the aircraft bought for Flight Simulator are military, so it's a fifth of the market. It's a, it's a lot of people who just want to enjoy flying the aircraft that they have that bigger passion for. I like all aircraft, but I tend to go for military. That's what I like. So um, I, I like DCS World. I mean, it's fabulous. Some of the aircraft in it are just, <laughs> I don't think you'll ever get more realistic. You, you'll get better looking to the, to the extent you might want to have the holodeck from Star Trek you can get in it and, and fly it. But they're, they're already kind of that level of detail, but there probably isn't a lot left they can add, um, mm. um, which is great. Uh, that's what they do. Um, but Flight Simulator has a bigger market and uh, a bigger share of the market in terms of numbers bought, um, and it's 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 just as good in its own way. It does what it does exceptionally well too. The, the experience of flight and uh, it doesn't like seeing a warbird flying around. It's great. Exactly. But not to mention fighters, especially ones like the Tomcat, which we don't see anymore in the air, mm. uh, sadly. So yeah, it's, it's somewhere you can do that. And you can still, I've had dog fights already in Microsoft Flight Simulator, um, including one completely random one that I was testing, the F 15s in Nevada somewhere, and another one was coming the other way. <laughs> Did it? Amazing. Got him. Oh, yeah, yeah, got him. Not bad because I was quite all the time at that, at that time, but uh, um, yeah, yeah, and he, he decided he obviously wanted to play inside the line. Had a, had a couple of tur you know, turning and burning over wherever it was, it's Arizona actually, but um, yeah. So it's exactly the same. You just don't squeeze the missile off at the end. That's all it is. Yeah. Amazing. So what were your thoughts when you saw the uh, the Top Gun DLC coming to Microsoft Flight Sim? Oh, thank God I haven't got to build an aircraft carrier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I loved it straight away. I mean, I had a Super Hornet package that was going to be converted. Um, um, but, you know, clearly the Cyber one's going to be great. I mean, it's, it's built core for the Sim. So I thought, well... That's fabulous. I've been building an aircraft carrier, uh, Kitty Hawk, um, mm. just as a background project. I thought you know, it'd be nice to have for the Tomcats, get it ready. Um, clearly, I, I don't think I need to do that now. It looks like the carrier is going to be pretty good. I can't wait. Can't <laughs> wait. Uh, the, most of the um, variables, tail hook, catapult launch bar, are active in the sim, but they don't work yet. And I right. think that's another example of a Sabre holding back. So I've got a custom animation for my tail book on the Tomcat and a custom animation for the bar. So we have to um, update those when the carrier module arrives. I think they'll activate all that at the last minute and yeah. get it going. But uh, yeah, I mean, night landings on a carrier in Microsoft Flight Simulator in bad weather. Oh, and that's going to separate them in from the boys just like real life. You know, oh, yeah. VR, and I can't wait. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> um, it's just, I mean, the weather for me is one of the biggest things about the scene. Being, yeah. a, being a, tra a trained pilot, even you know, it PPL level, but I know how important weather is, and um, I'm always posting pictures of cloud formations, and I probably bore the other guys to death, you know, because it's so spectacular. You've never seen anything like this in a flight scene before, so no, I really, I really get on with that. So yeah, when you're operating a carrier out and seeing there's nowhere else to go, you know, you've got to land. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be great. Amazing! I I can't wait. I think a lot of the like the community response when that trailer came out was pretty exciting. Because that it was a really cool trailer because they did the Xbox thing and everyone thought oh that'd be really cool and then suddenly this carrier appeared on the screen and then oh yeah it was it was Out quite epic nowhere. yeah and they, they they'd signed literally signed with Paramount so they got the music the recognisable uh, anthem there from Top Gun I think the only thing they can't use is the cruiser's face and it you won't let anyone use his face no but which is great big uh, helmet and visor probably visor on there yeah I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. 
he thought he might have been a bit more game for that. I would have thought <laughs> maybe put himself in there. But no, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'd be great. It'd be great to have another jet that officially kind of endorses fighter jets in Microsoft Flight Simulator as well. Mm. Um, and another opportunity to dogfight somebody else as well in something else. That'd be good. Exactly. And, uh, We've got the F-15s there already. F-16 uh, will be coming from SC Designs, hopefully September-ish, October-ish. So that's all the team jets in wow. the sim from either myself or some others. Uh, plus the T-45 from India Fox Street Air Carrier. So all that kind of carrier stuff is getting really well covered. It's going to be great. And the sims have only been out for like a, by the time all that stuff happens, about a year and a half. So that's just really incredible how impressive and how quickly... I mean, it kind of goes back to some of the stuff you were talking about earlier, some of the new tools and material um, engines that you have at the moment to help speed up the process of, of making these aircraft a lot quicker. And having the in-sim tools as well from the SDK certainly helps with that. Um, so I, is there anything else you want to just kind of touch on before we wrap things up? I know you've got a couple of aircraft all in development. I know we've touched on a few. Is there anything else you want to mention about some of your upcoming projects? Uh, the next big one after the Tomcats launch um, is Concord. Uh, that's kind of, yeah, it's the class. everyone does that. <laughs> Just like very excited about it as well. I did really well on the Sex and Pair 3D um, because it was the only Concord, that, again, it was in the middle. Yeah, the FS Labs one that was extremely complex, never came out for Pair 3D, understandably, because it's such a big job for them to convert it. Um, and so there was nothing that was more accessible. This Concord, is going to be more complex than that one um, simply because of what I was talking about earlier. We need a bit more going on. Yeah. Um, and, and that's going to be taking up the time then uh, until after uh, the autumn, probably. Uh, it's already underway, but I need, uh, the Tomcats are the priority project at the moment, the A and the B. Um, the Hornets, we're going to follow that. Um, obviously, I've decided now that's probably not such a good, a good idea. We don't need two, two packages and uh, a cyber will do a great job, I'm sure. So um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Russian. Um, after that, we need an adversary. Mm -hmm. At least to whom I'm aware of. So uh, um, we, we we have a flanker in progress, SU27, uh, which I'd like to see come out, and probably the carrier variant as well, because uh, yeah, Admiral Kushnikov, I think it is it's called, uh, probably might be far behind. I'm sure someone will do one. So it seemed like a good choice. Right. Um, and in the future, well, well, I can't talk about it yet because I'm not sure if it's even possible. But there's there's another particularly famous aircraft that I think I can do now, um, which will be instantly recognisable uh, when it when it is announced. Um, <laughs> so my, my plate is full. I'll get a lot of requests. Um, another one that's possibly on the list is the T6 Texan Harvard, um, mm -hmm. uh, because it just gets so many people asking for it, including other devs. <laughs> strangely. Um, <laughs> saying I'll do the Harvard, do the Harvard. So um, that's kind of my, there's a much longer list in existence, but they're the main ones. Um, and of course, SC Designs doing the F-16. So uh, we're pretty busy for quite a while. Yeah. Um, and anything anything that comes new to the sim, as always, gets rolled back onto previous products. So whether it be collimated HUDs or effects or a new one, you can do effects now, G-Vapor, stuff like that. Um, which is hopefully going to make it to the Tomcats at launch. If it works, then I'll roll that back as well onto the Eagles and so on. So really, at the moment, it's a case of trying to produce new product that we think people will like, and also just trying to keep up with the development of the sim so that as new things arrive. Radar is another one I'm hoping they will do. Mm -hmm. I've tried. It didn't work. So um, either I've got it wrong or just haven't got a grip of it yet or it's just not possible, but it should be. AI is visible, therefore it should be pick up on radar, mm. technical term that. Um, and uh, yeah, as soon as we can get a hand on that, something else again will be brought back. And the other one I'd like to see do it, doable if I can is um, forward looking infrared. Wow, which, okay. Uh, is, is possible in a, in a kind of a, again, smoke and mirrors way. It's not really FLIR, but it, it looks enough like it to be worthwhile. Um, I think that's everything. Concord really is kind of requires them to bring supersonic flight officially because also afterburners are not actually supported. The afterburners in, in my aircraft are custom. Okay. Um, yeah. They don't actually have that pick of thrust. Uh, you're just advancing the throttle linearly. 
Um, and I'd like to see them bring that in because obviously very important for Concord. It mm. could be done without them, but that's another update from Sober that I'd really like to see to um, to really give us, again, fighters. And with the F-18 coming, you know, they, they, I would have thought they'd have got it in there by then. Yeah. Um, wow. So very busy. Very, very oh, busy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very, very busy. Well into next year. Yeah. But I just, you know, I think people maybe sometimes think developers are just people doing a job. I can't wait to get up in the morning. So, I, you know, I, I was a really successful author. And people were like, why did you leave that behind? Because this is better. You know, I like <laughs> this more. I like, I like what I did then, but I like this even more. And I, I, yeah. If this thing is supported, as they're saying, for at least 10 years, you know, I'm going to, hopefully, I'll be able to be here doing it for all that time. I love it. Amazing. Well, it's, it's been wonderful kind of talking to you and actually learning a little bit about kind of yourself, the process that you go through to create these aircraft and also what you're hoping for in the future. I think it's this is exactly why Fly July has kind of been introduced by Orbex was to kind of dig a little bit deeper into what goes on behind the scenes because I think quite often we see our product get announced, released, updated, but we don't actually see kind of the efforts that you kind of go through to, to bring a product out. So I think this has been wonderful and I, I hope that the audience watching this will also feel the same. Um, so yeah, we're going to wrap things up there. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to me today. Um, for everybody else watching, please stay tuned. There is still plenty more Fly July content coming uh, over the next uh, well month. Um, we've got community fly-ins um, from a bunch of different community um, community members, I should say. We've got um, we've got more interviews. We've got another interview coming up. We've got the roundtable, and I know there's also some other special events going on as well to celebrate the 20th anniversary of that sim, and also a couple of other charity events going on as well. So be sure to check out the Fly July website, and you will learn everything there is coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, all there is left to me to say is thank you so much, Dean, for taking the time. Uh, my name is Callum from FS Elite, and we will see you on the next video.